Well, I'd like to start by welcoming all the participants to this fourth webinar in the series on gene drives by ANSWER Critical Scientist Switzerland, Science Citoyenne in France, and the Federation of German Scientists. ANSWER is the European Association of Critical Scientists. Um, the four of us, the four organizations, have done a research project on gene drives over the past years and published a report about this last year, of which we presented the results in Bern at a symposium. Um, and these webinars are um, a, a reflection of that report, really. Uh, each webinar uh, represents a chapter of the report. Um, we've had three webinars before this, um, and there's one to follow next week, next Tuesday. That will be the last one. I'll summarize the first three in a minute, but I think I should say first um, that uh, you can ask questions, which Christopher um, will be answering uh, after his talk which I don't know exactly how long it will take. Uh, Christopher, have you got an exact time in, in your mind? I can't hear you. You switched the mic off. <laughs> 45 minutes, I think. 45 minutes, okay. That means we also have about 45 minutes for the questions. Um, Participants, uh, please look at the bottom of your Zoom window. You'll see a Q&A button. If you press that, you can write your, your questions in the box that you get there. And at the end, we'll read the questions. I'll read the questions and Christopher will answer them. Um, we would like you to add your name to the question if uh, you haven't already stated your name upon registration. When you have, it will appear automatically with your question, but if you have not, please add it to the question because we will not answer anonymous questions. This is something that um, is uh, a policy of answer and the other organizers. Um, it is uh, a question of basic politeness and respect in physical conferences and workshops to state your name if you ask a question. Uh, and we think it's even more important in online events like this it's also our policy uh, to respect each other because uh, our business is critical independent science and respect for one another is part and parcel of critical science. Having said this, um, there is something else about the questions. We are in the process of putting the recordings online. Uh, we haven't yet, but we will do so. And um, of the previous webinars, we have left out the questions because we have a privacy law in Europe which forbids us to publish your names and we have read them out with the questions in the previous webinars. So we would have to get your written consent to put the recording online. And to avoid that, we just left out the questions from the recording in the first three webinars, but we shall include them this time and in the fifth webinar. We, um, we shall include the questions in the recording, but we will therefore um, not read out your names when we read out your questions. We did that in the first three webinars. We shall leave out reading your name this time and next time, but we want to see it. So we shall not answer anonymous questions, but we shall not read out your names for privacy reasons. So we can put the recording online and your name will not go online without your consent. Um, I hope that was clear. Then um, we are leaving your webcam switched off to save energy. All digital activities take a tremendous amount of energy. We don't usually think about that, but that's very important. And this is just a minor contribution to saving energy. And now before introducing our speaker, Christopher Preston, I shall summarize the first three webinars very briefly. The first one was given by Ricarda Steinbrecher of Econexis from Britain. 
about what gene drives really are, the technology and the science. Um, basically, gene drives are a new form of genetic modification that modifies or even kills an entire population of animals or plants in the wild. So contrary to normal genetic modification, which modifies one animal or plant at a time, this is really modifying evolution in the wild. The idea of that is not new, it has existed before, but the big game changer and the reason why gene drives are suddenly in the focus of attention is the development of new techniques, particularly CRISPR-Cas, which is the major tool um, with which people now attempt to make gene drives. Um, the most important thing, well, I shouldn't say that. One of the import most important things that Ricarda said at the end of her talk was that even if gene drives work as intended, this doesn't mean that they aren't a problem. And even if they do not work as intended, it still doesn't mean that they aren't a problem. She had been telling us about the uncertainties and the risks. And our second speaker, Mark Wells, expanded on that. He talked about the applications and the risks. He said gene drives so far have been shown to work at least in the lab, not in the wild, in fungi and in insects. It is very doubtful if they will work in mammals, but people would like to try. And even more so in plants, that's even more difficult to get them to work. There are plenty of ideas to use them to eradicate diseases, um, like insects that carry malaria, for instance, or to eradicate invasive species like rats and mice or weeds. But there are many un uncertainties uh, involved and um, this means that we think you should be very careful in applying them if you really want to. The big dilemma, which Mark pointed out, is that you can't really test gene drives without actually employing them, exploiting them. Because to test them, you have to release them, and that is an exploitation. Um, you, put them out, you put them out there, and they are there. So there is no way you can carry out a, uh, um, a complete risk assessment of gene drives before you release them. Mark, as well as Tamara Leeprecht, a third speaker of Third Scientist Switzerland and Gene Watch UK, um, they both pointed out that um, you shouldn't really start from the idea of the technology, from the gene drive, but you should really start from the problem that you want to address. What is the question that you want to get answered? What disease do you want to eradicate? What invasive species do you want to get rid of? And what are the ways, the means we have to do so? Because in every case, there are many different ways available. Um, some already realized, some can immediately be implemented, some cannot, like gene drives. No gene drive has been implemented yet. That is a very important thing to realize. And Tamara also pointed out, she talked about the social aspects in the third webinar. She also pointed out that there is a lot of hype around gene drives, particularly uh, around the technology of CRISPR is said to be able to do this or that, and gene drives are said to be able to quickly change an entire species. And that's not been proven yet. CRISPR has been proven to have many unwanted effects, undesired effects, side effects that haven't been expected. It is not as accurate as it is claimed to be. She also pointed out the increased reliance of gene drives on private investment and the conflicts of interest that this brings with it. And that, of course, these conflicts, of course, jeopardize the independence of the research. She also spoke about the precautionary principle, which she said applies to gene drives and it promotes good science and democratic decision making in Europe. The precautionary principle is a legal requirement 
to take into account. And finally, she said um, there should be prior and informed consent of any people affected by the implementation of gene drives. And that is laid down in the Helsinki Declaration and in other treaties like the Rio Declaration. Having said that, and I might have left out many important things, I'm sorry about that, it's impossible to summarize everything. Um, I would like to introduce Christopher Preston, um, our last speaker. And um, apart from saying that Christopher is from Montana, university professor, and will speak on the ethics of gene drives. I would like you, I would like to ask you, Christopher, to um, state your own background a bit before you start, because I have failed to take it on my screen in time to be able to read it out. I'm sorry about that. Um, but can I give you the word? Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you, Ensar and the other three organizations for inviting me along here. And thanks everybody for coming. Um, it's morning time here in Montana, and uh, I know it's late afternoon for some of you and people in different time zones, so I'll do my best to keep us at the same level of alertness uh, during this seminar. Um, so as uh, Diedrich said, I am a professor of ethics. Um, I work in environmental ethics and in the ethics of emerging technologies, and so as well as writing about biotechnology, I've written about nanotechnology, climate ethics, uh, climate engineering. So I have some experience in, in a range of different powerful emerging technologies. Um, you might, some of you might be able to tell uh, my accent by birth. I'm from England. So I spent the first half of my life in Europe and now uh, I'm living in Missoula, Montana. So let me uh, share my screen so that uh, we can see the slides I have to show. Okay, here we are. And I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, so I'm, I'm an ethicist, I'm a professional ethicist. And I want to start by making a couple of fairly general remarks about what an ethicist uh, can do or what you might expect from an ethicist when they look at something like gene drives. You know, what is the role of an ethicist? Um, here's one thing that I think everybody should understand ethicists do not do or they cannot do. Um, they don't have algorithms for solving difficult ethical problems. So one of the advantages of talking about ethics in the gene drive arena is that Everybody working in gene drives understands that there are ethical issues. And this, this ranges from the scientist who is most enthusiastic about gene drives to the advocate who is most pessimistic about them uh, and doesn't want to see them happen. Everybody understands that there are ethical issues involved. And sometimes I think there is a misapprehension that once you realize there's ethical issues, you bring in an ethicist, come on ethicist, come over, and the ethicist solves the problem. Uh, and I want to make clear right from the start that ethicists don't solve ethical problems. So what is it that you can expect from an ethicist? Well, I think what you can expect is that an ethicist looks at a problem and then tries to illuminate it as much as they can, tries to bring to attention different areas of the problem Sometimes what they do is they are showing what is most complicated uh, about the problem. And then occasionally they might say, well, this aspect of the ethics is being left out. This aspect is very important. It hasn't received enough attention. And I think we should focus uh, on it more than we are. So that generally is, is the kind of thing you can expect from an ethicist. And I think I wanna illustrate a comparison uh, which I think all of us will be able to relate to. Imagine if you, you brought in an ethicist to talk about the ethics of opening up a country after a COVID lockdown. Okay, so the ethicist comes in to talk about, well, what's the ethics of the opening up? 
Well, the ethicist hopefully would say things like, well, that, you know, on the one hand, you've got the potential suffering of opening up too early, the suffering and the death. Uh, you've got questions of disproportionate impact, who suffers most based on different structural features of, of a country. There's issues of the well-being associated with an economy that is allowed to work properly versus an economy that is shut down. Uh, there's issues of public versus private rights, uh, freedoms. There's issues of the obligations that you have towards the vulnerable. There's issues of young versus old, present versus future. So the ethicist would want to highlight all these different spheres but you wouldn't want the ethicist to say, okay, opening up July 7th. Uh, you might even not want the ethicist to be the person who decides that it is ethical to open up or more ethical not to open up. So the ethicist's job is not to solve the problem. Uh, the ethicist's job is to highlight the territory, uh, to look at the complexity and maybe to emphasize things that have not yet been emphasized. So let's start talking a little bit more about gene drives themselves. I mentioned that everybody recognizes that gene drives have ethical issues. Um, I'm gonna say something here that might sound obvious, but I, I think it's important about gene drives. Part of why ethics, the ethics of gene drives must be discussed is that the reason to deploy a gene drive is ethical. So any argument to deploy a gene drive is going to rest on some sort of ethical claim. Uh, and that's important because the reasons to deploy them are not uh, reasons that have less of an ethical dimension to them. So it's not just because they're an amazing technology. Uh, it's not because they might make some people rich or not. Uh, it's not simply that they are an interesting scientific type of project. The reason to deploy them, if you deploy them, uh, the, those reasons are ethical. And the types of reasons, if those of you who have worked a little bit in this area, the uh, human health arguments to do with transmissible diseases. There are conservation arguments often to do with the eradication of invasive species. Uh, and potentially there are ag agricultural arguments in terms of um, perhaps making uh, weeds more susceptible to herbicides that they've become tolerant of, uh, generally to decrease competition. Um, and so these are three sort of fairly serious ethical reasons why you might want to deploy a gene drive. So the discussion begins, in other words, with ethics. Ethics is at the very heart uh, of any discussion about deploying gene drives. There's another thing uh, I can say about why ethics is uh, there right from the beginning. It's not just that the arguments start in ethics. It's also that the technology itself is one that uh, raises a lot of ethical questions. So it, it's a powerful technology. It's a technology that does something uh, that previous technologies have not. It's a technology which is very difficult to test. Uh, and Diedrich uh, alluded to that in the opening remarks. Uh, you can do a lot of lab work, um, but some things are going to be very difficult to determine without actually deploying the technology. So it's a very difficult type of technology to test. And the technology operates in and on very complex systems. And when I say in a very complex system, what I mean is it operates in the genome, uh, an extraordinarily delicate uh, and complex uh, and multifaceted uh, part of uh, the body. And it operates on complex systems uh, in the sense that gene drives uh, are going to uh, be deployed uh, in environments uh, where there are multiple factors, uh, multiple variables, uh, and plenty of possibility for uh, events that are very, very hard to predict. So I think all of us who are here listening uh, understand that there's, there's going to be lots of ethics to discuss uh, with gene drives. Um, now, uh, I wanna put a sort of starting uh, 
parameter in place here. If all other things were equal, it's quite likely that we would not be thinking of uh, deploying gene drives. Okay, so this, this might strike you initially as, a, as an odd claim, but what I'm offering here, what I'm suggesting here is that um, gene drives is the type of technology which if you didn't have to deploy them, uh, you might prefer or you might think not to deploy them. And let me just provide two or three arguments why I think that the sort of starting point here is if you didn't have to deploy them, uh, you probably wouldn't. The first is that a gene drive is what uh, I'd like to call a metabolic level type of intervention. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, a gene drive is not a sort of superficial type of uh, alteration to the world. It's metabolic in the sense that it gets into how the world works. It gets into Darwinian principles Mendelian principles of inheritance, uh, and it changes how those fundamental operators work in the world. So it's metabolic in the sense that it gets under the skin, it gets into the system, uh, and it alters uh, inheritance uh, in a way that um, hasn't been done deliberately, intentionally for human purposes before. So that makes it a fairly significant type of intervention. Um, gene drives are difficult to test uh, for the reasons that we just uh, mentioned here. You can test in the lab, but without full deployment, uh, it's very hard to know all of the um, likely consequences of a gene drive deployment. And in addition to that, uh, gene drives, once deployed, are potentially uh, difficult to reverse. Um, that it's likely that they will cause changes that uh, are out there in the world uh, which close, potentially closes down, possibly opens up, um, but certainly alters the options that are available uh, for the future. And so for all these reasons, if you didn't have to, uh, I, I think it, it is likely that it would be preferable not to deploy gene drives. But of course, all other things are not equal. There are um, serious, uh, ethically significant reasons why you might want to deploy them. And so, you know, the question becomes, given this, this sort of background, it would be better uh, not to deploy gene drives if you didn't have to, but you're in situations uh, where the ethical uh, pendulum might swing the other way. The question then becomes for the ethicist, uh, if you have these highly desirable goods of decreasing human death and suffering, of increasing ecological values, uh, and of creating better, more desirable, cheaper, uh, more efficient operations in agriculture, then uh, should you deploy gene drives. So what does the ethicist do? So now we're gonna start getting into some of the tools or some of the resources that an ethicist can bring to this topic. I'm gonna divide my remarks into three different perspectives, which I'm gonna call lenses. And these roughly map a big report published in the National Academies of Sciences in the United States in 2016, Gene Drives on the Horizon, uh, and they also sort of roughly map different uh, um, structures that ethicists use, uh, a benefits harm type of lens or structure, a justice lens, and then third, a sort of broader worldview type of lens, which will take us a couple of steps back uh, to look at gene drives with a little bit more sort of perspective. So let's start with a benefits harms lens. What would that look like if you were using that to look at the ethics of gene drives? So very roughly speaking, this is a type of ethics called consequentialism. What that means is you think about consequences of doing something and you think about the consequences of not doing something and then you decide if uh, those consequences 
are desirable because the benefits outweigh the harms. So it's very much a matter of putting uh, the ethics on a scale and asking which way does the scale fall. Now, if you're going to have a scale, you have to have a metric. Uh, and your metric, if you're thinking about benefits and harms, can be a number of things. Um, perhaps the most obvious thing to put in that metric is uh, human health and well-being. Um, does this technology improve human health? Does it offer advantages that are going to outweigh any possible risks or disadvantages? Um, but human health doesn't need to be a single metric. Uh, it might not even be the preferable metric. Um, if your gene drive is going to be deployed in the context of conservation, your metric might be um, does the gene drive promise good for benefits for biodiversity or could it potentially harm biodiversity? Or if you're deploying your gene drive in the context of agriculture, perhaps it is financial efficiencies or costs, financial benefits and harms that are going to be your metric. Um, so you have to decide, first of all, which is your primary metric. Um, next thing you do, obviously, is you conduct your accounting. You try and project the benefits, you try and project the harms. And when you feel that you've done your accounting adequately, uh, you put your benefits and harms on the scale and you try and uh, imagine or project or uh, make a, a prediction about how that scale will fall. Now, this benefit harms lens, this consequence lens, um, is by far the most common, the most intuitive lens through which to look at the ethics of a technology like gene drives. And I think the reason it is the most common, the reason why people go that way, is it is the lens that looks like it has the most mathematical flavor to it. So I said right at the beginning that ethicists do not have algorithms. They do not have mathematical formulae for solving ethical problems. But using a benefits harms lens and uh, thinking of it in terms of a scale is a way of pretending that ethicists do. Uh, it's a way of making the ethical calculation look as objective as it can be look as quantitative as it can be. Uh, it's a way of doing what you can to simplify uh, the ethics of deploying gene drives. And this is a worthy lens. I'm not, uh, I'm not dismissing the importance of this uh, scalar version of doing the ethics. Right? You try to make it as mathematical as you can. But having said that it's, it's uh, intuitively plausible and it, it's, it has some desirable elements to it, I want to point out that um, this type of lens comes with some serious challenges. Uh, when you try and implement ethics as a scale, uh, and especially when you try and implement ethics as a, a balance between benefits and harms with a technology as complicated uh, as gene drives, you run into a number of problems. And the problems here, uh, the first couple of problems I think are, are sort of fairly uh, intuitive. And, and these are problems which, if you listen to the other uh, seminars, especially the ones about the science of gene drives, uh, I think these challenges would have been made clear. And that is that the benefits that you're gonna project uh, because of the difficulty of the testability uh, the benefits you are going to project are necessarily uncertain. You can make a good estimate. Uh, you can bring data to support the likelihood of a certain benefit, but you cannot be completely guaranteed to have that benefit. So um, whatever you're projecting comes with a certain amount of uncertainty. And on the negative side of the scale, so if, if you're uh, a little bit um, if you've uh, accepted there's a little bit of uncertainty on the positive side of the scale, you also have to recognize there's uncertainty on the negative side of the scale um, because there is the potential, because of the complexity of the system in which you're operating, um, there is the potential certainly for unanticipated harms, which makes it hard to calculate what's on that other uh, scale. It makes it hard to calculate how 
large the, the negatives are going to be and how significant the positives are going to be. Now, because my remarks are fairly general and they're covering both the, the public health applications of gene drives, the conservation applications of gene drives, and the agricultural applications, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time getting into uh, the possible uh, unanticipated harms or the possible benefits because that's been covered in the other seminars. But what I've done here is I've just, I've just sort of uh, accumulated um, a number of the uh, advantages that you read about uh, when you look at gene drives on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, uh, a number of the possible unpredictabilities, the possible disadvantages uh, that get mentioned in the literature uh, when you're considering the potential negatives. So, you know, we read lots of positive news about how effective, for example, uh, gene drives are suppressing populations. Uh, the lab results from uh, Imperial College London uh, on the mosquito population that was suppressed within 11 generations, I think it was, um, are really remarkable. You hear about the possibility of gene drives that are um, localizable, uh, controllable, uh, threshold drives, tear drives. Uh, you hear about the cost advantages. Uh, you also hear about the um, advantages gene drives have because they uh, mean that you don't have to use other measures. Um, so for example, if your concern is uh, an invasive species on an island ecosystem, instead of having to poison the invasive species uh, off the island, you send a gene drive and uh, with a suppression uh, factor in it and the invasive species disappears through the dream gene drive. So obviously you're not spreading all this poison around. Um, so on the one hand, there are a number of desirable pluses, a number of desirable um, results uh, that make you think that gene drives might be a go. Um, but on the other side, uh, you don't have to look very far in the literature to find all sorts of red flags, all sorts of reasons uh, why one might be hesitant or why one might be worried about unanticipated harms uh, that would suggest that gene drives might be stopped. Um, and like I said, this is not something you know, I'm an ethicist, this is not something I'm going to go into as far as picking out every different uh, advantage, every different disadvantage. Uh, but what I do want to illustrate with this slide is that it's not a simple matter to say the advantages outweigh the disadvantages, uh, or conversely to say the disadvantages outweigh the advantages. It is complicated, it is uncertain, uh, and it should create some sort of hesitation about the deployment of gene drives. So we're still with the benefit palms lens and uh, we're looking at, is it possible to create a scale which will eventually tell you, yes, we do this or no, we don't do this. Uh, and I suggested because of the uncertainty about the, the, ben the possible benefits and because of the uncertainty about possible harms and maybe unanticipated harms, uh, it's very difficult to use this uh, benefit harms lens effectively. But this is only one reason why it's difficult to use that benefit harms lens effectively. There's another reason too, which I think is an important one. And um, that is that the very idea of a benefit and the very idea of a harm is not always as crystal clear as we might suspect. Uh, there is a perception issue and a social element to what counts as a benefit, what counts as a harm, and what counts as an acceptable risk. So if the goal in the benefits harm lens uh, is to decide objectively uh, whether the benefits outweigh the harms, that uh, goal of objectivity is always going to be challenged by the fact that uh, in different contexts, 
in different societies, uh, perception of risk is going to vary. What people are willing to take on and what they are not willing to take on has important social factors to it. So uh, thinking that um, weighing costs and benefits is simple, thinking that it's objective, uh, thinking that it is the most scientific way to do the ethics of gene drives, um, that thought has to be, has to at least have a, a little caution note next to it that perhaps it is not as objective as you would like it to be. So there's two main reasons why the benefits harms lens is uh, difficult, but I want to add a third reason, and this third reason really is a bridge to uh, a different ethical lens. So the benefits harms lens was the first one. Um, there is there are other ethical lenses that are always going to have to play in to any type of benefit harms calculation that you make. And this is the first of the other lenses that I want to discuss today, the justice lens. So you can't think about benefits and harms without also thinking or also asking yourself, are there not other types of uh, ethical rules or ethical constraints that might um, interfere with this benefit harms calculation that I'm making. And I teach intro to ethics uh, to students who just arrived at university. And one of the ways we often illustrate this idea of there being some side constraints uh, is through the idea of a surgeon who is very keen to carry out uh, organ transplants. He has, let's say, or she has uh, 10 or 12 patients who all need organ transplants. Uh, and this surgeon wishes the best for them uh, and, and is confident that she can successfully conduct these surgeries. Um, but the side constraint on this surgeon's actions is that they don't go and obtain uh, those organs uh, in an illegitimate or an unethical fashion. So they don't go, for example, and kidnap people and use their organs. That is a side constraint. Um, the surgeon can have the best intentions the surgeon can have the best skills. The surgeon could even be pretty confident that the results of their surgery, if they have these organs available, can be pretty confident those results are going to be good and they're going to create happiness. But there is a side constraint. The side constraint is you don't go take those organs uh, using illegitimate means. So any uh, benefit harms lens that you use has to be constrained by other uh, certain considerations. And the considerations of justice uh, are the ones usually brought in here to constrain that benefit harms thinking. So let's turn this conversation to gene drives again. Um, so we're, you know, we're trying to think about benefit harms, we're trying to balance them. And then we have to ask ourselves, are there other justice types of constraints that are gonna come in going to uh, cause us to modify our benefit harms type of calculation. This is the first justice constraint that I think is uh, highly relevant in this context. Um, the constraint of self-determination and or possible dependency. Uh, and this is particularly applicable to the case where we're talking about uh, the use of gene drives for public health uh, purposes uh, particularly in countries where um, the uh, promotion of the gene drive uh, is coming from outside the country uh, and the gene drive is going to operate inside the country. And so the, the obvious uh, illustration of this is the development of a gene drive um, with the intention of suppressing uh, the mosquito vector for malaria. Um, so you've got a technology coming being developed outside uh, of countries in Africa and the place where the tests uh, are uh, most advanced at the moment, where the deployment is most likely to come soonest is uh, Burkina Faso. Um, so the, the constraint here is the constraint of self-determination. Um, the ethicist is gonna be concerned about whether uh, the people who, will, who have the 
most to gain as well as the most to lose, uh, whether there is adequate and sufficient self-determination uh, in order to give the go-ahead for deployment of gene drives. Uh, and alongside that self-determination, sort of the uh, partner of that self-determination constraint is the concern about dependency. Um, are countries, are people uh, able to determine their own future uh, through the use of certain technology? Or does the use of that technology make them dependent upon another uh, country uh, and another uh, group? So those two are possible side constraints on any benefits, harms calculation that you might have about deploying gene drives. Um, in the same vein, related to this concern about self-determination is the concern about power. Uh, who, who's developing technology, who's deploying it, uh, who is accumulating power, uh, who, is, uh, who has the um, potential to make choices uh, for other people. Um, now my point here is not that uh, one could not deploy a gene drive, even one could not deploy a gene drive in a country which was different from the country in which it was developed in. Uh, but my point is that when you are doing that, uh, these are side constraints that you need to keep your eyes on, that you need to be uh, very aware of. And Certainly in the case of um, target malaria and in the case of gene drives from malaria in Africa, um, that these issues of self-determination, these issues of power, they do come up. Um, I'm not a social scientist, I haven't uh, been on the ground and uh, studied this, but if you just keep an eye on the news here, you know that these issues of self-determination do come up. You know that there, is a, there are at least some voices, and again, I'm not gonna claim uh, that these are a majority of voices or that these voices are representative, I just don't know that. Um, but it's enough to see that there are some voices that are concerned about those issues of power and concerned about those issues of self-determination. So that's one sort of, one set of constraints on any cost benefit type of thinking. Uh, another thing I, I think is relevant with gene drives is <clears throat> the discourse over gene drives. Uh, it sort of, it, it flows very fast. Um, the enthusiasm for the technology uh, is such that uh, the discourse seems to move in the direction of gene drives very quickly. And if you look at the headlines, these are just sort of random headlines that are pulled from various internet stories over the last kind of year or two. Um, they're very compelling headlines. Um, that last one there about conservation benefits, uh, gene drives and CRISPR could revolutionize ecosystem management. The power of these headlines are such that the discourse about what to do about invasive species, what to do about transmissible diseases, what to do about agricultural pests, um, that discourse can very quickly flip towards the technology, uh, towards the very sort of attractive, powerful technology. And uh, it can flip in a way that perhaps risks obscuring certain things. Uh, and when you see that happening, when you see the discourse uh, sort of birching to one side, um, you have to, I think as an ethicist, you have to at least be alert to that. Uh, and you have to sort of think about whether that's always, uh, whether that's likely to be a good thing. I've used the word technologism here. That's rather a, a complicated word, but the idea there is um, just the sense that you can dangle the possibility of a, a powerful, shiny technology, and you can, in the process, eliminate discussion about other sorts of possibilities for uh, treating uh, a certain conservation problem or an agricultural problem or a public health problem. And so this brings us to what I think is another type of justice concern whether the, the way the discourse moves creates a moral hazard. The moral hazard is a situation where the kind of things that you should be doing to confront a problem are getting eclipsed or put aside uh, because something else has come onto center stage and has dominated uh, 
your attention. And so again, the, the easiest context perhaps to talk about uh, this in is the context of disease eradication. It would be a moral hazard if gene drive, discussion of the, the possibility of gene drive uh, for these public health concerns, it would be a moral hazard if that uh, discussion eclipsed or pushed off of the radar the other sorts of things that one might be doing uh, in order to combat diseases like malaria. And uh, without being a public health specialist, I can't talk with any authority about these other things. But you know, it is it is noticeable that you know vaccines from malaria, malaria have been very difficult to develop. Um, there's one in tests for the last year. Uh, that you know, there's questions about its effectiveness for sure. Uh, there's questions about its side effects for sure. But um, that that at least is uh, a malarial um, treatment that is in the works and which. Don't, you wouldn't want to let gene drives eclipse um, that off of the radar. The, the general sort of public health uh, things that can be done for gene drives, such as were done in Zanzibar, uh, can sometimes be effective, not completely effective, but can sometimes be effective. And then there are other types of um, developments. Uh, recently, this, this headline on the right was just from last month, uh, uh, microsporidia microbe has been discovered to completely uh, prevent mosquitoes from being infected through malaria. So th there's these, in, this, in this slide, there's these three other possibilities, which you know, I'm not saying that these are better malarial treatments or better malarial avenues. But what I am saying as, the, as an ethicist is there is a danger when one uh, treatment, one approach occupies the whole of the, the space, the discourse space, uh, and pushes the other possibilities off of the radar. Um, that is a, uh, a, con a side constraint. That is a concern um, that might uh, or should weigh in alongside any list of proposed benefits and any list of proposed avoided harms. Uh, this is a, a side constraint to that discussion. So um, self-determination, power, control of discourse, moral hazard. And this last one, I, I won't spend very long on, but I mentioned uh, right at the start, the gene drives um, possibly changing options for the future. Um, certainly uh, in the conservation domain, one can imagine uh, a gene drive changing an environment uh, in a way that hopefully opens up benefits for the future, but also close down options for the future. So that's an intergenerational type of justice. Uh, and one might also think in terms of interspecies justice. Uh, this does not feature very prominently in drive literature uh, at the moment, but it, it could. Uh, and this is justice between humans and the species that they uh, propose to alter. So everything on this slide is a side constraint. Everything on this slide is something you might want to use in addition to uh, your benefits, harms type of lens. And then I promised that I would turn to a third lens where we're going to back up a little bit uh, and think of gene drive in terms of the type of worldview or attitude uh, it promotes. Um, so we're going to think of gene drive in terms of how does it have you look at the world? And is that a desirable way to look at the world uh, or not? And so I've got uh, four or five things that I've listed here. Uh, and here's the first of them. Um, this is sort of a, a, a hybrid of a, a scientific and an ethical type of concern about uh, the worldview. And, and that is that a gene drive tends to promote perhaps an attitude that is reductionistic. Uh, what that means is that it promotes an attitude that thinks that the problem is solved at a level uh, which is small, to put it simply. The problem is not solved by looking uh, at the whole genome level or at the uh, 
excuse me, it's not solved by looking at the organism level or the organism in system level. It's solved by looking at the gene. Uh, and understandably, what science does often is it uh, reduces a problem to its smallest components and tries to resolve it at that smallest level. But I think there's some question about whether genomes uh, can be uh, reduced down to genes. And, and the, the thing that illustrates that uh, in the science of uh, gene drive is in, in the, these strange uh, occurrences that occur with CRISPR genome editing, um, where changes distal to the edit site uh, occur with um, remarkable uh, unpredictability, uh, with remarkable regularity. Um, you get uh, lesions distal to the cut sites, uh, you get uh, insertions, uh, you get deletions, you get effects of a CRISPR genome edit that weren't predicted. And what seems to be happening is the reductionistic approach to genomes uh, is not telling an adequate story uh, about how those genomes function. And so that's a, a, perhaps a scientific problem but also one can sort of broaden that to think of that as an ethical problem uh, where your focus is in the wrong place. So that's one worldview aspect uh, associated with gene drive that I think is worth thinking about. Um, perhaps accompanying that is the possibility of overselling the amount of control over those uh, reductionistic style of edits that you're going to have to do for gene drive, uh, overselling the amount of control of the outcomes that you can have. Um, so this ties back into the uncertainty that we discussed when we were talking about benefits and harms. Um, it may not be that you can predict with confidence uh, what you need to predict with confidence in order to go ahead with gene drives. And so the danger of overconfidence or hubris here uh, overconfidence in the amount of control uh, I think is a real danger. A third type of worldview concern or worldview issue that one might want to raise is uh, looking at problems in uh, ways that are too uh, singular uh, without backing up and looking at problems in ways that are more holistic. Um, I have a colleague in environmental ethics, uh, Ron Sandler, who observes about CRISPR and observes about gene drives, that it embodies a, an attitude or worldview where if the world is doing something that is creating a problem for you, uh, if an organism is doing something that is creating a problem for you, um, you don't step back and look at the big picture and see how you can prevent that problem from occurring, you zero in and you change the organism so that that organism doesn't create the problem for you anymore. And uh, this colleague you know, suggests that, that we, we ask questions about whether that is the right attitude, uh, changing the organism uh, to suit uh, the world that is uh, the world we want rather than Of the, of the problem, uh, but things that could be changed uh, at a different level of problem solving uh, instead of focusing in at the organism, focusing in at the genome. Um, following from these concerns about reductionism and non holism, um, what a gene drive might do in terms of attitude uh, is it might cement in place the idea that a technological fix is always desirable, rather than uh, different types of fixes, perhaps uh, behavioral fixes, perhaps uh, systemic fixes, perhaps uh, fixes in terms of how society is organized. Can we uh, invest more, for example, in, public, in basic public health facilities, rather than uh, hoping for uh, a, a 
very um, dramatic technological fix to come in and solve the problem for us. Um, this is a work question. Where do we want to approach the problem? Do we want to approach it technologically? Do we want to approach it behaviorally? Do we want to approach it socially? Do we want to approach it economically? Um, all of these options should still be on the table rather than letting the technology uh, take over the discussion. And finally, uh, a technology like gene drive or like CRISPR genome editing advances what I, I call, this is the term I've used in my work, uh, a synthetic age, the idea of a world increasingly shaped by technology, increasingly shaped by human designs and human desires, uh, such that it departs more and more from the world we inherited, it departs more and more um, from that uh, historical product of evolutionary forces and becomes increasingly a product of human forces. Uh, we enter a synthetic age. And uh, my claim here would not be that all elements of a synthetic age are undesirable. I wouldn't claim that at all. Uh, but in terms of worldview, uh, it's something to think about whether a gene drive takes you down a path towards a synthetic age when you would rather not go so far down that path or would rather go down that path much more slowly. So I've covered three different uh, lenses, three different ways of thinking about gene drives. Just to recall, remember the first one is the one that seems most plausible, it's most intuitive because it has the appearance of being most mathematical but it's plagued by questions about uncertainty. It's plagued by uh, social dimensions. When we thought it was just objective, it turns out the concepts of benefits and harms are social. Um, so I suggested that uh, that benefit harms lens doesn't work perfectly. I said that harms, benefit harms lens should be constrained by considerations of justice. And those are things like self-determination and power, uh, inter, generational justice, interspecific justice. And then I also said we can back up and we can look at the types of worldviews that gene drive embodies and ask questions about the sorts of attitudes, the sorts of worlds that we want. Um, now, it would be great if you could separate those three lenses, uh, consider them completely independently of each other. But I think I've made it clear that uh, much as you might hope to rely on just one of those lenses, find it bleeding over into the other lens. Uh, and so we end up with this, you know, what is admittedly a very complicated ethical issue, a swirling ecosystem of values uh, where you can't completely, uh, you can't look at a problem entirely from one perspective and solve it from that perspective because those other perspectives come in and complicate the picture for you. So just in my last few slides here, what I want to do is I want to go back to what I said right at the beginning about the role of ethicists. And I said, you know, part of what ethicists do is we uh, show the complexity of a problem. Uh, and another part of what we do is sometimes we draw special attention to certain areas that we think are particularly important. And um, what I thought I, I would just uh, close with is just from my own perspective, and the reading the work I've done on, on gene drive. Um, what are the areas that to me seem most at risk of being neglected uh, and seem to be some of the most ethically significant ones uh, to discuss? So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go three slides here. One where we're talking about public health types of uses of gene drive and so the uh, Addressing vectors, mosquito vectors, for example, with Zika or dengue or malaria uh, would be an example of that. Um, for me, at least, those issues about self-determination, so those were the justice types of concerns. Um, those issues about whether the people most affected are having uh, a legitimate type of expression of their preference. Uh, to me, those strike me as being the most important. And, and gene drive is interesting because it's not something that every individual can opt in or opt out of. If we're talking about uh, 
um, the spread of a drive through an insect population. Uh, if that insect population is in my area and if that gene drive has been released, I don't have the option of being involved or not involved because I'm automatically involved. So my self-determination is potentially compromised there. So those issues I think are extremely important. You be very careful about them. Uh, and adequate uh, guarantees about self-determination uh, need to be made. And I wanna add a second one here too. Um, the worries about moral hazard are the other options for treating that public health crisis, are those other options being funded adequately, explored adequately? Uh, are they being pursued on the ground to the extent that they should be? Because often those options come with co-benefits. Uh, so for example, improvement in basic public health facilities uh, doesn't just uh, have the ability to reduce cases of malaria or cases of mortality uh, from diseases like dengue. It also improves lives outside of uh, those particular diseases. Uh, and so it is a moral hazard. Your focus goes entirely to one technology and uh, neglects to address those other technologies that might also come with co-benefits. So those are two things that just strike me as being very important in the public health arena. In the conservation arena, I, I indicated I wrote about the synthetic age, but I do worry in the conservation arena that the idea that if you have a problem, you just send a gene drive out there, potentially changing the world in perpetuity uh, through that gene drive, uh, making the world a more humanized world, a more technologized world, making the world more synthetic. Uh, that to me seems potentially a problem, something that we should worry about. Uh, and in addition to that, um, the complexity of the ecological systems into which gene drives would be put, I think creates extraordinary worries about uncertainty, uncertainty about the benefits and uncertainty about the harms. Uh, and I think those, in, those conservation applications of gene drive are really worth paying attention to. And then finally, in cases of agriculture, uh, where we're talking about, let's say, uh, making a problem plant, palm amaranth, for example, in the United States, making it more susceptible to something like glyphosate. Um, it could sound like a way to increase efficiencies in the production of food, but does it also result in the concentration of power? Um, this is a justice type of side constraint that I think is worth paying attention to uh, in the agricultural applications. And uh, similarly to the conservation applications, the uncertainties that play conservation, uh, I think, are relevant in agriculture too. Um, you have a complex system, the genome, you're making an alteration and putting it into another complex system the ecological environment uh, and you're hoping that your predictions about what's going to happen are accurate and uh, I, I certainly think that's an important uh, hope to scrutinize uh, important things to pay attention to. So in conclusion, um, we live in a time of some extraordinary technologies. Uh, and I mentioned at the start nanotechnology, climate engineering, uh, these sorts of technologies raise ethical stakes higher, I think, than they have ever been. And gene drive certainly fits in that package of unusually powerful types of technologies. Um, and the type of scrutiny they desire uh, is, is the, the bar is very high. Uh, close scrutiny, inclusive scrutiny. And so what that means is when you are concerned about the ethics of these technologies, you don't uh, Look, just look at the American ethicists in Montana. Uh, you look at the ethics in different places, uh, in different cultures. You look at the ethics amongst people with different worldviews, uh, and you see what it is that different people find to be morally relevant, morally significant uh, with, with the technology of gene drive. Uh, and you investigate in the most transparent way possible. You're honest about what you feel confident with, you're 
honest about what terrifies you uh, with the prospect and you include that transparency in your discussion. And I, I wanna close by bringing a gene drive scientist in uh, and showing through what Kevin Esfeld says that um, this is not, gene drive is not just something that an ethicist like me gets very uh, agitated about, or it's not just something that um, tells an ethicist that there is a strange type of power, a strange type of moral calculus at place here. Gene drive is something that the scientist too recognizes as being uh, different, uh, deserving a different type of scrutiny. And just to return to a remark I made at the beginning, um, Everybody involved in gene drive, from the strongest advocate to the most hesitant uh, person objecting to gene drive, everybody recognized that gene drive is different. And Kevin Esfeld here in this interview he did uh, with the New Yorker a couple of years back um, illustrated that nicely, I think, with this quote. Um, you've got those public health benefits. Uh, you've got those agricultural benefits eliminating the disease, but perhaps there's something else that gene drive does that we need to pay attention to. And that is that gene drive has the potential to change the way that we do science and technology. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, that's an overview from an ethicist and uh, I'd be happy to try to address any questions you might have, and see what you want to talk about. Okay. Thank you very much, Christopher, for this beautiful expose of the ethics of gene drives and especially for the way you make it all quite understandable without using any complicated philosophical or ethical terms. You threw a few in, but only to say in ethics we call this such and such, but you used perfectly understandable terms to explain all the ethical concerns, which I think is a great achievement. Um, well, um, I notice that um, it has not been so easy for participants to ask as many questions as it was in the previous three webinars, which is funny because um, some of the questions in the previous webinars were actually about the ethical concerns. And we said, these questions will be answered in the ethical webinar, the fourth one, and you have actually already answered them by your talk. But still, there are some questions. Um, let's take a look at them. I think some of them um, will deserve a good answer. All of them deserve a good answer, of course, but um, some of them may take a little more time to answer. The first one is from Siguna, Siguna Müller. Uh, that was about the beginning of the talk. Um, the balance lens, the balance perspective, uh, the benefits and harms, the scales that you used as an image. Um, how do you use one metric like finding a common denominator in all these different contexts and environments. For instance, at the relevant biological level, we do not even have a basic mathematical logic. It defines Boolean logic. You would have to deal with both, with both stochastics, infinite Hilbert spaces, fuzzy logic, etc., etc., And then you have to carry it over into the gross scale and overlay it with all the real life applications. How do you do that? So the, the question how is written there in capital letters with big question marks, big exclamation points, suggesting that it's very difficult. And I, I think one of the things I wanted to make clear right at the start today um, is that a lot of people involved in, in the, the development of, of these technologies, the politics of these technologies, the civil aspects of these technologies, um, they hope that there is a way for somebody to say, well, look, I can tell you what is ethical here or what is not ethical here. 
And uh, that hope is understandable because the, the issues are complicated. Um, you know, when I first got involved in this, I, I, your initial reaction is, well, how can you not want 400,000 people to stop dying of malaria? You know, of course you want 400,000 people to stop dying of malaria every year. Um, and so you want to have a clear answer that says, yes, you can do this and you should do this, uh, or no, you, you couldn't do this. Um, but what I want to make clear is that ethics is not like that. Ethics is not the solving of very complicated questions. Ethics is the illumination of conversations that need to happen. Uh, and after those conversations, uh, civil society, government makes decisions about how to proceed. Um, and so in all of those three applications of gene drive, whether it's public health, conservation, or agriculture, um, the decision about whether or not to proceed is one that uh, must be made through uh, inclusive, democratic, participatory channels. The ethicist can uh, say, this is an important issue that we're not paying enough attention to. Uh, or the ethicist can say, this is an ethical consideration which will be completely ignored if we go this direction. Um, but the ethicist cannot solve that problem. Uh, it's solved through difficult, political, uh, public, and inclusive discussion. Uh, and you, know, you have to sort of get a sense of what a particular uh, stakeholder prioritizes ethically to know whether uh, to proceed with a certain gene drive application in a certain environment. Um, so the, the sort of exas exasperation expressed in the question, how do we do this? Um, the exasperation stays there. <laughs> um, the exasperation doesn't go away because you brought an ethicist in. Uh, the exasperation stays there. Difficult public conversations have to happen. Uh, the ethics needs to be as inclusive as possible and as broad as possible. And you know, I apologize that there isn't something simpler, but I don't think there is anything simpler. No. So the question is, is completely appropriate, uh, but also completely unanswerable. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for trying, anyway. Um, I'm afraid the order, I've messed up the order of the questions somehow. In, on my screen, but I think the next one in chronological order is the one from 5.02 p.m. Uh, which says, do ethicists have any ethical obligation to report researchers that are acting in unethical ways? For example, the Chinese scientist Dr. He or He consulted with US ethicists and his advisor at Rice University before he used gene editing to make two or more GE babies but none of the people he consulted reported him to the US or Chinese authorities. Just as uh, scientific research on these complicated topics needs to be honest, open, inclusive, uh, so ethical research or ethical discussion uh, needs to be honest, open, inclusive, transparent. Uh, and it, it seems pretty clear that if uh, something that is a blatant ethical transgression. And uh, in the case of the, uh, the use of, of genome editing uh, on those two uh, Chinese children, babies, uh, there was a, a consensus that um, uh, such a practice was crossing an ethical line. And that was a consensus not actually enforced from the outside, but it was a consensus amongst the uh, people working in that arena. Um, so this was a, a line, an ethical line that had been drawn by those people participating in a scientific community. And if somebody uh, crosses that line within that scientific community, then I think it's, uh, it's not a community. There isn't an obligation to 
to uh, make public the line that's being crossed there. So um, I do think it's fairly clear in that case that there was an obligation to be open about what was happening and that obligation was not met, then I, I, that looks ethically problematic, yes. Yeah, this case had big repercussions in public, of course, and for the researcher concerned in particular. The next question chronologically is the one from 5.10 p.m., which says, in all this, who is responsible for making sure that the issues with gene drives are looked at from the perspective of these different lenses? In the previous webinar, there were mentions of multiple examples of conflicts of interest with corporations or philanthropists, ignoring public commentary or true informed consent. How do we go about making sure that the research and technology is looked at through all lenses and that it is done ethically? Is there a governing body or laws that are responsible for making sure that this research is done transparently and doesn't go too far? That's, the question goes a bit in the same direction as the previous one, doesn't it? Who can take, clear, take care that ethics is actually implemented? Yeah, it, it's, um, it's, a good, you know, it's a good question. Like, is there a uh, mechanism in uh, governance and policymaking that ensures that the ethics is present? Um, in my experience, it's a, any mechanism that exists is, is very messy and very informal uh, and very dependent upon who is sitting at the table. Um, in my own work, you know, I, I work at a university, which means that most of what I do is I stand up in front of classes and, and talk to students about ethics. And then I also write for journals on ethical issues. But in, in my, from my own perspective, what I have seen the need to do is to throw myself into these discussions and to participate where I can. So that sometimes means getting out of the classroom, getting out of the academic journals, uh, and going into public fora, uh, putting myself into conversations that sometimes are very uncomfortable. Um, you know, it's much more comfortable just to stand in front of students who you've stood in front of many times or to be in journals that you are familiar with what the journals like to talk about, but put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Um, uh, insert yourself into public conversations where you can. If you have the chance to attend a, a side event at a conference of the parties meeting on biodiversity or on climate change, go there, um, be in that conversation. Uh, policy is made by those who show up. And so um, I don't think, I mean, it, it varies country by country, um, but it's not common to have ethics formally in the structure of decision making. Um, the, the United Kingdom's research councils do include ethical components. Uh, and I'm sure there, you know, there's various examples in Switzerland, for example, um, their ethics is formally part of uh, government policy on biodiversity and on plants and animals. Um, but it's really, it's formalized very differently on country to country bases. Um, and so uh, I think that the, the idea of making it more formal uh, is uh, I think a good idea. Uh, Norway, for example, is, has been taking ethics very seriously in the biotechnology realm. Uh, and I would like to see more countries formalizing that role and uh, more people who work in ethics getting themselves out of university context, getting themselves into the public context. Um, and, and ethics is, is this funny discipline. It, it's, it's a bit of a... Um, sleeper discipline in the sense that people don't always talk about it openly but it's always there it's always it's always in a conversation of a difficult technology and a, of a difficult discussion about what to do the ethics is always there 
um, and it would be nice to uh, call it what it is, formalize it, uh, make it a required part of conversations about public policy. Uh, because in the backs of their minds, everybody is thinking about the ethical issues. And so making that more public, uh, more recognized as part of the discussion, I think is important. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, I suppose it's quite hard to formalize it, isn't it? Um, uh, this is a really interesting point. Um, um, can you actually legalize, for instance, uh, ethical considerations uh, and force them upon technological uh, development projects like this? Um, uh, you mentioned Norway as a good example. Uh, how do they do it there? Do they have any 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 legal requirements, um, legal ethical requirements? So the, the Gene Technology Act in Norway does actually have the ethical considerations are one of five groups of considerations that a prospective genetically modified product needs to meet in order to be accepted within uh, the country. Um, and. Uh, that has been used once or twice to, as a <clears throat> component of the decision making, uh, to refuse a particular GM product uh, in Norway. So it, it can be done, um, but it, it's yeah, it's it's tricky, and and um, ethics feels vague, and it feels. Uh, like it's not mathematical enough and and you know, this is a challenge because it's not mathematical. Ethics is not mathematical. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's ethics is powerful uh, and uh, it certainly has a place in decisions about technologies that are capable of changing things in dramatic ways for dramatic numbers of people. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned two limitations of that. It, it's in Norway. It's it's taken up. Uh, the ethical consideration is taken up in the genetic engineering law, so it's restricted to genetic engineering. It doesn't apply to other technologies. And you said it was used once or twice, which seems to mean that it is not an obligation for the government to use it. Well, it was it was decisive once or twice where the ethical consideration. Uh, was it determined the decision. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the the gist of our question of the questions of our participants is that uh, um, is it possible to to enforce um, ethical requirements uh, at all? And even in Norway, they don't do that. And I, I understand at least that it's not a legal obligation. It is it is an option that the government can use. Yeah, I'm not, I, I have colleagues in Norway who would be perfect to speak to you about this. <laughs> We're reaching that sort of edge of my knowledge of how it works in the Norwegian system. Yeah, yeah I suppose it's quite hard to, uh, to impose this in any way, isn't it? Um, let's look at the next question, the one from 5.12 p.m. Humanity has been intentionally altering our environment and the organisms in it for thousands of years. We have more precise tools now arguably better. So what is really novel or different about gene drive? It is a novel technology, but what is novel about the ethics? Yeah, this, it's a good question. Um, because, you know, clearly every organism changes its environment. You know, if you are a beaver building a dam, uh, if you are an elephant eating trees out of a forest, you know, you're changing your environment. And, humans have been changing their environment for um, tens of thousands of years. Um, I do think there is a difference with gene drive. Um, and I, the way I would capture it would be to say that um, you know, gene, gene drive is, is deliberate, it's precise, and it is intentionally sent out into an environment that is not human control. Um, and it's sent out into that environment with the express intention of changing that environment. Um, so there's nothing small about this. There is nothing uh, minor or temporary or controlled about it. 
Um, it is a precise change that is deliberately put out uh, to go as far into the world uh, as designed to go. Um, and I, I just don't think that has been the case before. Uh, it's it's a, a degree of change, it's a quality of change uh, that I think is different. Um, one, now if that's not convincing, and you know I, I understand that won't be convincing to everybody, but I think a second um, the level of response to the question uh, that was asked there would be this. Um, considering ethics of the environment, ethics of other organisms, um, bringing that into scrutiny is a matter of saying which changes go too far and which are acceptable. And so if you adopt the standpoint uh, that the questioner raises here, you know, and, and, and so the standpoint that's in the question is, well, this is not different, so what's the problem? Um, if you adopt that standpoint, uh, then that ability to say, these are the things that are okay and these are the things that are not, uh, that ability goes away. Um, now, that might be attractive to some people, you know, the idea that, well, anything we can do, we should do because we've, we've been doing things like it already and so we should be just free to kind of carry on doing things that are similar enough, um, these appear to be similar enough uh, that they don't raise an issue. And um, to me, that, that sort of robs you of the, of the ability to say, this is the sphere of things that lay within the human purview. Uh, and this is the sphere of things that lay outside. Um, and so the capacity to say this is different is important for identifying these spheres and for showing which ones don't create so many problems and which ones potentially do. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a good question, you know, why is this different? Um, and, and my answer is, you know, I, I think it is different because of the intention to put it out into the wild. And then the follow-up to the answer is, even if you're not convinced by that, um, isn't it the case that uh, discussions of this kind are about identifying things that are acceptable and then finding other things that are not acceptable uh, and finding ways to separate those two. Um, so that, you know, the idea that anything can go, anything should go uh, just because we can do it, I think that's, that will be ethically problematic too. So, you know, I, appreciate the, I appreciate the question, but I think the line drawing is really kind of important. Right. Thank you. The next question then, the one from 514, says, thanks for your very clear presentation. What do you make of xenofeminism and the demand of trans people for do-it-yourself gene editing to have self-mastery over one's body versus collective consequences? So I guess I'm alluding to the use of the self-determinacy -determin site constraint self-determinacy site constraint as an argument to use certain impactful technologies. Well, I, I'm not, um, that, that's a, a sphere of discussion that I haven't been involved in, so I can't speak with any authority on that. But my, my first reaction there is that, you know, self-determination is an important site constraint for a reason. And that reason is the ability for people to freely choose what they want for themselves, whether that is susceptibility to a gene drive, whether that is uh, a particular type of identity, um, that's an important consideration. Um, that value of self-determination is, is one that should be prioritized in many, many contexts. 
Um, and so uh, without any uh, knowledge or expertise in this area, um, my initial reaction would be that yes, self-determination is a decisive factor. Okay. Then the next question, there's three left. You touched on the crux of the matter for me. The conversation is being driven by the richer companies controlling the media presentation for product development and scientific reductionist thinking. This is leaning to the synthetic solutions, starting with the failure and pollution of fossil fuels. And this ignores human control, which perpetuates adverse behaviors. How can the ethical public alternative view get heard? Yeah, you know, this, this, is, this is sort of the lifetime's work, isn't it? Um, you know, the issue of power is, is decisive here. Uh, power in, in many political economies, in, in, you know, I live in the United States, uh, it has dis, power accumulates disproportionately and it exerts disproportionate control over the political process and it's, it's a tragedy. Um, <laughs> As an ethicist, what does the ethicist do? The ethicist sort of stands up there and says, be aware that uh, centralization of power is problematic. And you know, perhaps you don't need an ethicist to feel that already. Uh, it is problematic. And one uh, simply has to keep highlighting that uh, this is, um, power has been disproportionately accumulated. Uh, Power interferes with self-determination. Uh, it interferes with democratic process, uh, and it needs to be uh, steps need to be taken to mitigate that accumulation of power. Um, and you know, I think one one thing that uh, one one place of hope here uh, is where you see uh, honesty and openness. Uh, when you see sort of willingness to let people determine their own future, when you see that at work, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not here to talk about the uh, the sort of uh, to, to highlight um, efforts that have been made in the gene drive discussion, but in, in some parts of the gene drive discussion. Uh, there has been an acknowledgement that uh, decisions here are not to be made by powerful people working at powerful universities backed by powerful sources of money. Decisions are to be made by people who will uh, bear the brunt of this technology. And uh, uh, you know, Target Malaria has uh, outreach efforts uh, I don't know a lot about the extent and the quality of those, but there are outreach efforts. Um, the uh, Gene Drive uh, proposal to address Lyme disease on islands off the U.S. Northeast coast, uh, that was brought to a halt by public opposition um, because the scientists involved agreed from the beginning that this was not something they were going to do just because they could. They were going to let people decide whether they wanted that. So even though the battle here really is a battle about power, there are places where you can see the recognition that it is the right thing to do to let people determine their own future and not let that future be determined for them. And I think highlighting those places, highlighting where that does happen, showcasing them, saying this is how we like things to work. Um, I think there's a, a lot of value in doing that uh, while continuing to be aware of places where that doesn't happen and, and trying to stop that from happening where that public involvement is, is not. Right, thank you. Then the next question, we're running a bit late. Uh, I hope you don't mind. Okay. 
the participants don't mind. Thank you. The next question is, in your experience, what are the best options, successful examples, to switch the responsibility of taking decisions on these highly problematic issues from small groups of experts to include the overall population into a transparent and ethical scrutiny? So this is, this is a good question. It's the right question, isn't it? Because, um, you know, I sit here as an ethicist and say, well, we should do this. We should be more public about this. So we should be more inclusive about this. Um, but, you know, that's just a, a wish I have. <laughs> it's not, I, I haven't provided a mechanism more. Um, I mean, one thing I would say is that there are people whose work, uh, and th those people are not me, uh, there are people whose work is designed around um, public inclusion. Uh, I've done a little bit of work here with social scientists. This was not actually on gene drive, it was on climate engineering. Um, but there are tools for public participation. Um, there are ways of including people in focus groups uh, and deliberative processes. And actually a little bit of this work is happening with gene drive uh, in California. Uh, some of it has, has taken place, um, where you get a sense of uh, what a local community thinks about uh, something. Um, of course, the challenge is to, to translate what might be a, a project conducted by somebody at a university, uh, how to translate that into policymaking arena. Um, and that doesn't always happen unless the decision-making process is one that explicitly includes or is, is compelled to include that social science data. Um, so I don't have experience of those social science mechanisms um, that allow uh, some sort of uh, taking the, the, the temperature of the public on a particular issue, but there are people who do it uh, and making sure that uh, when those results come in, making sure that those results are included in decision making uh, through those focus groups, uh, through those uh, public partic participation exercises, uh, making sure that is included is obviously a priority. And so, you know, I would encourage, just as I would encourage people to use the word ethics in these discussions more, uh, I would encourage people to talk about the public and to talk about uh, mechanisms of including public in decision making. Right, there's one question left, and that goes between the scientists, sometimes biased by the publisher of Paris system, the policymakers that might want to look like white knights with silver bullets, and the public that does not have a full understanding of the technology. Do you feel like there is enough antis to conduct a dialogue where both pros and cons are discussed equally? So I, I appreciate the question. You know, it's uh, one of the things the question sets up is that there's a lot of different uh, factors that are uh, making this discussion go poorly. You know, you've got academics who are pressured by publish or perish. Uh, you've got policy makers who have their own political interests at work. You've got very, very complex topics. You know, like, you know, gene drive is not a simple topic. You've got very, very complex topics and people don't have the time to immerse themselves in a gene drive literature. Um, so is this discussion good enough or is it getting steamrolled uh, by, let's say by, with, with economic interests or uh, particular goals in mind. Um, the discussion is not good enough. You know, the discussion can always be better. Uh, it can always be more inclusive. It can always be broader. One thing I, I would want to sort of reframe in the question, you know, the question says, are there enough antis or are there enough people willing to express caution uh, for a fair discussion here. Um, so in, in my experience, 
and, and I don't have great experience in this. I, I offer this just as a sort of first, um, first take on, on the question. In, in my experience, uh, if you enter a discussion as an anti or as a pro, the first thing you do is you inhibit the quality of the discussion. So if you enter a discussion and within 30 seconds, uh, it's clear to everybody in the room that, well, oh, she's just dead set against this, or uh, they are uh, completely brought up into this without asking any questions. Um, if you enter that discussion that way, the, the lines are drawn immediately and at the end of the meeting, you'll pretty much be where you were at the start of the meeting. Um, what seems to be, what seems to work better is to find a way to empath empathize with those who are on the other side, quote unquote, of a particular issue. And so, you know, when I've been to Gene Drive meetings, and, um, you know, I'm at meetings with people who are developing the technologies that target malaria intend to deploy in Burkina Faso. Um, it's very important for me to uh, understand the humanitarian motives at work and understand the integrity of some of the people in that discussion. I, I owe that to them. Uh, if I'm to be ethical in, in my participation in the discussion, I owe it to the person, quote unquote, on the other side, to recognize their humanity and to uh, look for the integrity on display. And then hopefully if you begin like that, that is reciprocated and your humanity and integrity is rec recognized too. Uh, and that promises a discussion, I think, that is more fruitful than if you begin the discussion with the idea that there's going to be a big pile of people on this side, and I need to make sure the pile of people on this side is, has the same voice. Um, as, as, I, as we discussed in, in response to earlier questions, in most of these contexts, the power is loaded uh, in favor of development and deployment and, and the potential success of the technology. In most of these discussions, the, the uh, publicity is uh, leading you to believe that um, there's an inevitability to the deployment of a certain technology. So um, you're right that these discussions look like they're already stacked. And if you have some hesitation about the technology, it feels like you are up against an immovable mountain. But with that said, you know, I think that the way to enter the conversation is uh, not to enter it in a way that keeps the conversation polarized, but to enter it in a way where the common humanity is recognized uh, and maybe that creates the possibility of, of budging people a little bit closer towards common ground than might otherwise happen. But you know, this, is, this is a very, very difficult topic and, and probably many of you listening are more involved in the, the actual uh, boots on the ground policy making than I am, and probably you're more frustrated by the way those discussions go. Um, but I, I would still encourage a, a sort of open, uh, and, um, open, honest, uh, and respectful dialogue whenever you can get into those conversations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, that was the last question from the participants. I actually have one question left myself, if I can, uh, even though we're running over time. On one of your last slides, you quoted Kevin Esfeld as 
saying the single most important application of gene drives is to change the way we do science. I don't actually understand what he means, do you? I wonder what he does. Well, I, I would recommend that. So that piece was in a New Yorker article by Michael Spector. And the, the gist of it was that um, Esfelt was saying, and he was actually talking about the, the project to eliminate Lyme disease off the islands uh, of Martha's Vineyard area in the United States. Um, he was complaining about uh, the, the sort of intellectual property aspect of technology development. He was complaining about the lack of um, the ability of the public to say no to a certain technology development. Um, and so what, what I understood him as saying was that with a technology as powerful as gene drive, and earlier on in the article, he, he had said something like, you could make a species, a whole species extinct with this technology. So he says, with a technology as powerful as gene drive, the only ethical way to do this is with complete honesty and complete transparency. And if people don't want it, you don't do it. You shut down your lab and you stop developing it. And the, the reason I put that quote up at the end um, is because it, in, in my work in, you know, both in biotechnology and in climate ethics and climate engineering, um, it does seem like the tools at our disposal have a, a type of power that previous tools have not had. And, you know, climate engineering is, is just an interesting thing, just to bring in quickly to be able to change the climate of the whole planet for everybody at the same time by putting particles into the stratosphere. It's not a technology we've had before. And so when you're developing a technology that powerful, you have to develop it differently. The, the process of development and the way you move towards potential deployment, it has to be done differently. It has to be done more inclusively, more transparently, and you have to accept that maybe at the end, you'll be told not to use it or not to do it. And so Esfeld is saying, uh, we got to change the way we do science. Now that we have tools this powerful, we got to change the way we do science. And uh, to, to me, that's sort of a recognition of the power of the tools uh, and of the, the um, height of the stakes involved. You know, the stakes are very, very high. Uh, and and I, to me, it's encouraging when you see researchers and people who are developing these tools, when you see them recognizing how high the stakes are, that's very encouraging. Um, and it, it's a reason to sort of stop and say, well, this is different, actually. This is a, this is a new game we're playing here. Um, so I was very encouraged when I saw that by Esfeld. Uh, and that's why I wanted to highlight it, that, that we're in a different game. The stakes are different. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's actually a really positive quote. And he says what, what Gene Rice should teach us is that we, we really need and we can incorporate ethics into science. Make it an inherent part of the way we do science. I really wish we will, everybody will, certainly with these powerful technologies, not just you guys, but other ones as well. But I think that's a great note to end this great webinar. Um, it's very unfortunate that uh, in this case, uh, you can't get any applause, because we will please imagine it, because you fully deserve it. Thank you so much for Pleasure. this excellent webinar. In the chat, there's actually a few comments saying so. Thank you very much for this webinar. This session with Christopher Preston was excellent. And another one says, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. So thanks again, Esther, Christopher, and I hope we shall meet in person sometime soon again. Yep, my pleasure. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody, for me and from the other organizers as well. And thank you for taking part in this webinar. Bye-bye.